Some of you may know that before I was ordained as a bishop in Melbourne, I think about 13 or 14 years ago now, I was a lecturer in theology at the Catholic Theological College in Melbourne. And in order to become a lecturer in theology, I had to spend an awful lot of my time studying, as many of you have and perhaps still are. I went to, before that, of course, I went to a teacher's college. So I had some years teacher training in a Catholic teacher's college. So we did a fair bit of theology as part of that course. I then, as a Salesian, did the seven or eight years of study uh, to become a priest. After a few years, I was sent to Rome for two years to do what's called a license. It's like a master's degree in theology. And then when I came back to Australia, part of my time was spent here in Perth teaching at Notre Dame, and part of my time was back in Melbourne teaching theology there. But for seven of those years, I was also trying to finish a doctorate. So I'm not saying any of that to boast or brag or anything, but simply to say that the study of theology has been an important part of my life for a long time. I'm a big fan of theology and good theology. I have a conviction that unless we understand our faith well and deeply, we won't know how to live it. The living of our faith depends largely on what we believe in the first place. And theology opens that up for us, particularly faithful theology within the context of our Catholic community. Having said all of that, I'm conscious that not everybody here would have either the inclination or the opportunity to spend 8, 10, 12, who knows how many years studying theology. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a deep appreciation of the church's theology because there's another pathway, not necessarily an alternative, but it's certainly another pathway and one that actually helps those who do study theology to understand better what it means. It's what St John Paul II used to call the theology, the lived theology of the saints. And I think what he was trying to get at was the idea that even if you didn't have endless hours or months or years to devote to the formal study of academic theology, you could gain a profound understanding of what it is to be a Catholic and called by the Lord to live faithfully in his church by getting to know the stories of the saints. I mention that because today happens to be the feast of Saint Polycarp and I imagine he might not be at the top of your list of favourite saints or the ones you know most about. These days we can always hop on the internet and learn a little bit about him and I don't really want to talk so much about Saint Polycarp this morning except to say that he was a bishop and a martyr. Those things don't always go together but sometimes they do. He was a bishop and a martyr at the very earliest period of the church's life, probably a disciple, a companion of St John the Evangelist, so right there at the very beginnings of the story of the church. And because of his fidelity, he lived a long life, he was in his 80s when he died, but because of his fidelity, he was martyred during the early persecutions of the church. St Polycarp, I have to confess, is not at the top of my list of favourite saints, but I do think it's worth reflecting about who is at the top of my list or your list of favourite saints. And if you don't have a list yet, I'd really encourage you to start developing one. Because the saints tell us what theology looks like when it's lived. And we're here this morning to commission youth leaders for the Archdiocese of Perth and you will need to be able to live the theology of the church, that is, the truth about who God is and who we are and what God's asking of us if you're going to be effective leaders in the Lord's Church here in this Archdiocese. So you might spend a little bit of time today if you get the opportunity reflecting on who your favourite saints are. We happen to be, for example, in a chapel dedicated to Saint Therese of Lisieux. She is happen, ha, does happen to be one of my favourite saints. And in the more traditional churches around Perth and around Australia, you will always find a statue of Saint Therese because she was one of the patronesses of the missions 
and Australia was a mission territory when it was first established as a European settlement. St Therese has a great deal to teach us, but one of the things that stands out about St Therese, which stands out about most of the saints, is that she had an instinctive understanding that at the heart of the church stands the person of Jesus. That means that at the heart of your life, your ministry, your presence as a member of the church must stand the person of Jesus. And there's nothing perhaps more profoundly true theologically than the importance of Jesus as the way that we follow the truth which we believe and the life which we live out in our own lives. It's the motto, as many of you know, uh, of my episcopate. Via Veritas Vita, Jesus the way, the truth and the life. I often reflect on who my favourite saints are and I've got quite a long list so I'm not going to tell you about all of them this morning and some of you will have heard me speak about this or, or read things that I've said about this in the past but I wanted to say just a couple of things and it's not an uh, a kind of a, an attempt to convert you to my way of thinking so that my favourite saints become your favourite saints. It's more about inviting you to enter into the really very exciting story of the lives of the saints. We have 2,000 plus years of stories of great saints in our Catholic Church. It would be a great pity if we didn't know a little bit about them. I mentioned St Therese and her statue is over there. Most traditional Catholic churches would also have had a statue of St Anthony of Padua, Franciscan. I'm not quite sure why St Anthony was such a popular saint uh, in, in Australia, but he was and still is. When I was a little boy, there was a statue of St Anthony in the porch of the church, the entrance of the parish church where I grew up. And as a little kid, I used to go down there on Saturday mornings for confession and then I was an altar service, so I was always hanging around the church. And it's, I used to stand in the, the, the porch, the entrance to the church, and stare at this statue of St Anthony. I was only little, I would have been eight, nine years old, something like that. It fascinated me and I'm not quite sure, I wasn't sure then why it fascinated me, but as I've grown, grown older and reflected on it, I've realised what it was. Many of the traditional images of St Anthony always show him either with a book in his hand on which is standing the infant Jesus or he is holding the infant Jesus in his arms. And in most representations of this, they're staring into each other's eyes. And I think that was the beginning of my understanding, I didn't read about it in a book, it was the beginning of my understanding that at the heart of the Catholic faith and everything about the richness of our Catholic faith is all directed to leading us into a relationship of love with the Lord. I would have been, as I say, eight or nine or ten years old at the time. I'm now 65, so I've got about 55 years of a failure to really live that way as much as I would have liked to. But I've never lost the sense that that is what the church is about. Another of my favourite saints, you know that I'm a Salesian, the order founded by St John Bosco, he is one of my favourites. But even more uh, appealing to me, if you like, than Don Bosco was one of the boys who went to his school, Dominic Savio, who became a saint uh, even though he was very young when he died, just short of his 16th birthday, and not a martyr. He died of an uh, illness that was very common in the uh, 19th century, tuberculosis. But he became a saint kind of in an interesting way because at one stage, Don Bosco, St John Bosco, was talking to the boys in his school and he said, God wants everybody to become a saint. And it's easy to become a saint, Don Bosco said. All you have to do, basically, is do your best at whatever you're trying to do or find yourself in at any time. So he was talking to a group of boys in a school, pretty rough boys at that many of them. He said, so when you're in the classroom, you do your best to study as hard as you can. When you're in the chapel, you do your best to pray as, as sincerely and as deeply as you can. 
When you're in your playground, you throw yourself into the games and have as much fun as you possibly can. And if you do those things, you'll become a saint. And for me, as a young boy who went to a Salesian school and then as a Salesian, this struck me very strongly. Certainly in the Salesian tradition, sanctity is meant to be the normal experience of everybody, not some extraordinary thing that only very rare people uh, can achieve. So they're just two examples of people who have emerged in my life's journey as significant people who have led me to understand what the Christian vocation is all about. There's another phrase we could put in place of saint, and it would be faithful Christian leader. So when I speak to you now, and towards the end of Mass, when we have the commissioning of the new leaders, my hope is that we're commissioning saints. And that might sound ridiculous, but it's not ridiculous at all because sanctity is just living the life God has given us to the full, making the most of everything God has given us and living it out in fidelity to what God is asking us. That's what sanctity is. That's what holiness is. So in hearing the call to Christian leadership and accepting the call to Christian leadership, you're really kind of committing yourselves to doing your best to be saints. But don't be frightened by the word, understand exactly what it means. It's just an invitation from God with the promise of the grace to accompany the invitation to be the very best person you can be. Being a Christian leader means walking in the footsteps of the Good Shepherd and leading others to walk in the footsteps of the Good Shepherd. It means taking seriously the words of the Father that we heard in this morning's Gospel. This is my beloved Son, listen to him. As you think about what it means to be a leader in your parish or other community, as you think about what it means to be a Catholic in the Archdiocese of Perth, as you think about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in this very difficult world in which to be a faithful disciple, the one person to listen to is Jesus. Listen to him. It's almost exactly, isn't it, what Mary said to the stewards at the wedding feast in Cana when they said to those stewards, do whatever he tells you. If we put those two ideas together, listen to Jesus, do whatever he tells you, then you will be the leader that the Lord is calling you to be. You will be on that path to sanctity. You might not end up uh, canonised, most of us won't, but you'll be on the path to sanctity, which means that you'll be on the path to the fullness of life, which is God's promise to us all. 